So here you go. Let's start, and then we'll have some testimony time. We must pay more careful attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. Amen. Amen. Uh, down. Philippians 2, 14, do everything without complaining, do everything without arguing, so, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God. Amen. Psalm 27, the, the Lord, um, I lift my eyes into the hills, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Jesus said to them, For I have not come to abolish all the prophets, for I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except to me. Amen. Amen. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Psalm 119.11, I have hidden your word in my heart, so I will not sin against you. Matthew 28, 7, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Amen. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 3, 11 through 13. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. And may he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when the Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Second Timothy 3.16, all scripture is god bring and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Amen. Amen. Training in righteousness. For I know the plans I have to for you, says the Lord of Jeremiah. Amen. 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 Acts 1, 8, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. God, God the, the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit, these are three in one John, one John, first John, five through seven. Acts 16, 41, believe in Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Amen. Psalm 1, 6, for the Lord knows the way of righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Amen. Psalm 25, verse 4, show me your ways, O Lord, teach me your paths. Amen. God is love. Amen. Amen, Lynn. Thank you. God is love. Proverbs 4, verse 25 through 26. Let your gaze look directly before you and your, ponder the path of your feet and your ways will be sure. Amen. Amen. Children, thank you. Oh, wait. Hold on. Stay up here for one second. Did you remember your verse, young man? The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving to the soul. Amen. The law of the Lord is perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> Children, it's time for Sunday school. For those who are with the collection, if we can have the collection this morning for the Lord's Saints. Brother Fetty or Brother Sandu, whoever's responsible, if you guys can help us with that. We are really early this morning. We still have some extra time, so I think it's time for some testimony. Does everyone have something or anything to share this morning? Brother, come on up. Please take a minute. I have a scripture, a couple scriptures. It's, um, regard not familiar spirits, mediums, wizards, to be defiled by them. I'm the Lord your God, Leviticus 
1931. Amen. Exodus 11:7, the very first Passover at 12 midnight, not one dog barked. Ephesians 6:12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, spiritual wickedness. Proverbs 11:30, he when it souls is wise. Acts 4:12, there's no name under heaven, Jesus' name whereby we must be saved. John 3, 17, for God sent not his son into the world and condemn the world, but through him the world might be saved. I encourage everybody to stay in prayer because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And anywhere we go to uh, pass, um, do evangelism, tell somebody about Jesus. It's a lost world out here. Amen. And there's people starving, suffering, people with addictions. And, you know, Jesus said... I, my yoke is easy, my burden light, but we're the walking epistles, you know. We got to share the message of Jesus with them. Amen. Thank you, Brother John. Appreciate it. Thank you for sharing that. I especially like John 3.17. That's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Everyone quotes John 3.16, which is an amazing verse. But John 3.17 is also extremely important that God did not send his son to condemn us, okay? He did not send Jesus to condemn us. He came, he sent Jesus to save us. Praise God for that. Does anyone else have a testimony this morning? No. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you again, Brother Don. Chris, it's your turn. Come on up. Let's listen to the Word of God together, and afterward we will have a chance to respond in prayer. God bless you all. Uh, while the tech team gets the PowerPoint ready for this morning, I just want to say a good morning and a blessing from the Lord Jesus Christ for all of you that are here in church. And for those of you who are online, and for those of you who will one day stumble upon or actively search out this uh, video or this sermon, may God richly bless you where you're at in your times of need or in your times of celebration. Amen? Amen. We have a very light service this morning. Um, as you saw, the worship team is out in North Carolina with a um, type of youth retreat that is going out there. And uh, so we're, we're bare bones this morning, but that's all you need. Because when the Spirit of God is present, it's only two or three, and we're a lot more than that here, uh, for the Spirit of God to work amongst us. Amen? Amen? So Brother Lemmy already spoke a little bit about what we do at this church, and I don't believe any one of you are new here, but just in case you forgot, because sometimes we forget, right? Sometimes we forget that we come here to pray. Sometimes we forget we come here to worship. And sometimes we think we just come here to socialize, which is an interesting part of church and part of it, I, I would agree. But I don't want you guys to forget the main reasons that this church was built and open. And so if we turn our scriptures to 2 Timothy, I'm sure most of you have this highlighted. I just want to let you know why it is why we're doing this next sermon for the next half hour or 40 minutes. It says this, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. So that means that when you want to preach it or when you don't want to preach it, when it's accepted and when it's not acceptable, preach the word of God. Correct, rebuke, and encourage. And sometimes we forget about the encouraging part. And this morning, I'm going to preach a sermon that is very unlike sermons that I've preached before. Some people might say you're going to be too encouraging. I don't know if that's possible especially coming from my style of teaching. But that's okay. By the grace of God, we have to be able to do this every single time to the body of Christ to build each other up. Amen? Amen. Yes. And I'll try to use, as the Bible says, in great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from truth and turn aside to myths. Amen? And so that burden falls on my shoulders a little bit more than just coming to church. And so I would appreciate it if you already continue in that state of prayer that the Lord continues to work this morning up into the point where we say amen and, you know, go enjoy your lunch, okay? So we want him to be present and to be able to bless and to be able to convict in such a way that encourages us to love God. I know that sounds strange, but all of you who are parents out there know exactly what it means to be able to rebuke in love 
Some of us forget and we only rebuke, but the best time our children learn is when it's done in love. And so that's what I want to go through today because today is going to be a little bit of a heavy topic where a lot of people might point fingers and, and I want to be able that we teach through this properly so that we're not blaming anyone but that we're learning what the Bible has to say. And so, fitting as always, I'm going to start off with a few questions. And this has nothing or little to do with the pandemic, has little to do with the economy, it has little to do with jobs or many different reasons on why you might be sad. But this morning I'm going to ask you a question and I want you to truly internalize and answer this question. It's a very simple one. Why so glum? Why, why the long face? Some of the Romanians don't understand that it's an expression on why the heavy heart? And I know that we can um, fake it a lot of times when someone asks us, especially when we come to church, how are you doing? Great, brother and sister. Praise God. But inside, it's not necessarily the case. And it's difficult. I mean, if, if you're married, you have kids, you have a job, you have, you have uh, a mortgage, right? So your, your burdens seem to pile up and pile up and pile up. And so my question for you, dear brother and sister, is why the heavy heart? I have my answer on why sometimes it just seems unbearable. And I'm sure you have your answer as well. But this morning, I want to focus on the heart. And it's a very interesting topic. Okay, some people can get it wrong, some people get it a little bit too, uh, too right, if that's even such a thing. But I want to dive into this, into this topic because sometimes it's under our own control. Why we have this heavy heart, why we seem to be burdened. Sometimes it is in our control. Sometimes maybe it lies in the control of others, like our friends and our family. Sometimes what they do or what happens through them can impact us to have such a burdened or a heavy heart. You might say, well, it's not my fault. It's, it's their fault. And, and I don't want to teach in such a way that causes people to call themselves the victim or be able to point fingers and lay the blame on others. I want to teach what the Bible has to say. And then we're going to look at sometimes it feels like it's God's fault. Now, we're not going to get through all of that today. The next couple of weeks that I'm programmed to preach, we're going to go through all of those bit by bit. Is it me that causes my heavy heart? Is it my friends? Is it my family? Or is it God? So it's, it's a lot to unpack. And so that's going to be, I don't want to call it a sermon series, but that's going to be what I'm looking at because the more and more I see are more and more glum faces. So the masks came off, but no one's smiling, right? That, that, that's, that's a problem, okay? We're, we're still the same underneath that mask. And the thing is, for us as uh, children of God or, or people who, who come to know and want to have um, relationship with people of the church, so you could be a visitor, you could be first time here, or you can be a senior here, I want, to be, I want you to understand why it is important that our hearts not be troubled. I know it sounds impossible, Okay, I, I know that there are some things where we think they're cliche that come from Scripture, but I want you to understand the power that comes to understanding biblical promises and allowing them to really take root in your life. As you can see, I'm still in camp mode, okay? So I still have some of those uh, principles laid in heavy on my heart. So I want to read some Scripture, and I'm going to reference these three Scriptures often when we get to these blocks, when we get to these hinders, when we get to uh, these burdens, because I don't want to minimize it, right? I, some of us think, well, my, my paycheck is reduced or I've been laid off, and that's a difficult thing. Some of us, our own parents or siblings have died from disease or cancer, and so these things, you think, how can they not burden me? How can I not come to church with a fake face on when I barely sleep at night or I'm worrying about my kids or, or, or many of the different other reasons that can penetrate the person to the point of breaking. But I want you to understand that the scripture, the word of God, what we believe is that God understands our world completely, 100%. And to be able to identify with this heavy heart 
God took form of human flesh and walked amongst us. And he understood what it was like to have a long face. He understood what it was to have sorrow in his heart. He understood why his heart at many times could be so heavy. And yet, even when God could experience this, he gave us promises in his word to be able to get us through this. And so this morning, I want to encourage you in such a way that you are taught how that even when difficult circumstances come your way, whether it be a pandemic, whether it be a separation, a divorce, a death, whatever it may be in your life, that God knows that you understand what it means to have a heart that is heavy, but one that is joyful and complete in his will. Amen? Psalms chapter 73, verse 26 says this. My heart, sorry, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. What this is saying is that, you know, you might get sick. And there might not be a medicine or a vaccine or there might not be a healing divine intervention on God's part in your life. But even if your flesh may fail and even if your heart may fail, how does this happen? Well, you can lose a parent. You can, use a, you can lose a sibling. Your children can be out into the world. Many different reasons. You could lose your job. You can, you can have many things come upon you. But even if your flesh or your heart may fail, God is the strength that gives your heart that next beat after one, after the other, after the other. That doesn't allow you to crumble where you are, but to allow us to strengthen you in such a way that you can move past this and your portion forever. John 14, verses, John 14, verse 27. This, these are the words of Jesus. Let not your hearts be troubled, Net, let not your hearts be afraid. If anything, all our hearts have been the last year, year and a half, two years, is troubled and afraid. Right? That's why people hoard tissue paper and toilet paper, because they're afraid. Normal people don't do that. People who are not afraid don't do that. Okay? We don't stockpile up water because we think that there's going to be no water left. Or tissue paper or many silly different things. And so we've been in this state of trouble, of fear, of being afraid. But God, through Jesus, tells you, do not let your heart be troubled. Do not let your heart be afraid. And we'll get to the reason why not to, but these are the encouragements that I want to share with you to change that face of yours from one that is long and sorrowful, but to one that has joy. The last verse, Psalms 31, verse 24, be strong. And let your heart take courage, all of you who wait for the Lord. So understand these verses, these three verses. We're going to reference them back and forth. If you have a highlighter or if you have a pen, scribble in your Bible where these are because we'll jump back and forth. So let's go to the first one. Some of us have a heavy heart. Some of us have sorrow because of our own hand. Because of ourselves, because of our desires, because of our own decisions. I know that in this society, especially in 2021, we only blame others. It's their fault, it's their structure, it's they're in charge, and it's all their fault that I'm in the state I'm in, in, the, in that I have the money, the job that I have. And they never look inward. But before we can go through solving why maybe we have a heavy heart because of ourselves or our friends or our family or wrongfully think that God is oppressing us, we have to first start off with a reflection. Because we can address the issues with our friends, we can address the issues with our families, we can even come to the right theology, but if we don't address the sorrow that our own heart causes in our lives, we will never find joy. And we will never find peace. And so we have to address ourselves first, right? We see this biblical principle all the time. Take care of yourself, right? Take the, the plank out of your own eye before you help someone else. Same thing on the airplanes. When the airplane loses cabin pressure, you put on your mask first, and then you help someone else. Well, to help your heavy heart, and a lot of you are 
and go through a lot of difficulties, whether it be through family or work or whatever it may be, understand that the first step in lifting the burden off of yourself is addressing yourself. Like I said, some things you can control, some things you can't. Let's talk about the things that we can control. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says this about me and about you and about everyone on this planet. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Some translations say, who can tame it? You see, the reason that many times in my own life that I find myself in grief, in sorrow, in trying to isolate myself from everybody else, away from my family, away from God, is because my own heart got me in trouble. Because my own heart was deceitful. Because we hear lots of times hallmark-type preachings like, follow your heart, but that's the worst advice anyone could ever give you. So this verse says that the heart is deceitful above all things. And a lot of people say that, well, we, this is contrary because we think that people are born uh, good and then it's their, their environment that ruins them or changes them or makes them greedy um, or makes them stubborn or makes them impatient. I'll tell you that's not the case. Just by having a small child, a six-month-old, if one of Elise's sisters, well, this would be Evelyn, is having a pacifier in her mouth, the little one who just learned how to crawl will crawl across the entire house to rip it out of her mouth and to try to put it into her mouth. Okay, so there is jealousy and there is stubbornness even at six months of age. I see this verse implemented in a, in a six-month-old where her heart is deceitful and all she wants to do is whatever she wants to do. And if I let her crawl down the stairs, walk up the stairs, touch the stove... Her heart desires those things, but I don't allow her to do those things. You see, a lot of people say, well, okay, that's, that's, that's a kid. They don't really understand. But every CEO, CFO, every single entrepreneur um, that ever existed, that doesn't have a new heart, and we'll get to that, their hearts are deceitful above all things. Every president, every senator, every single one. And you want me to give you an example? Just a couple of, maybe a decade ago, we had all these social medias come out where we can post pictures so I can finally see a picture of Greg and Anka from Canada, where I can finally see pictures of my friends from Romania, where I can finally see what God is doing in Africa. And I don't have to wait for a newsletter. They just upload the picture and bam, I can see it. And whoever thought that from something like that, from talking to each other, from sending messages to each other, now... Because the heart is deceitful and wicked, we can take those pictures and own those pictures. We can take where you took those pictures and know where you are. We can take all the information about you, private information, and sell it to other people because it makes money. And other people want to know where you are and what you spend money on, whether it could be government or other things. I'm not being paranoid. I'm just telling you what's happening right now. Why do you care where I'm at? Why do you care what I buy? They do. To make more money. And so what starts off as something that seems to be just social media, just a picture of my kids, a picture of my friends, uh, learning where my friends from high school went, now becomes a, 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 such wicked and such deceitful that we have to turn off our phones and turn off the location and take out the battery and smash the SIM card. Maybe that's a little bit too far, but you guys know where I'm getting. Left unchecked, it can be in government, it can be a company, it can be a church. But if those don't have a heart that is changed by God, their heart will always be deceitful and wicked. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 8 is the scariest verse uh, in the Bible. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will reap in return. The one who sows to please his flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. But the one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. What is this saying? You can't get away with anything. God will not be mocked. You can't, I mean, I can get away with some things with my parents, right? Because they're not as tech savvy as I am, and so I just, you know... You can, go to, you can hide the text messages. You can put the pictures in a different folder. So when your parents ask for your phone, they don't find anything. 
I could fool my wife, right? So, you know, okay, I'm going to come home at this time, and then I could go to the bar, to the club, and, you know, I can change my shirt and put on cologne, and she won't know, and everything's fine. I can, I can, I can very simply fool my children. Where were you? Oh, I was mowing the lawn, and the grass is like eight inches high, right? But you can't fool God. And this deceitful heart that you and I have that is the cause of many times our heavy heart the whole expression, you reap what you sow, that comes from Scripture. That comes from the Bible. And what it's saying is that everything that we um, sow negatively and out of hate and out of greed and out of sin will bring back destruction. But you see, not all sorrow is bad. I know people assimilate sorrow with something bad, but it's not bad. It's actually life-saving this is what 2 Corinthians chapter 7 says. For the sorrow, or what many of us would call brokenheartedness, that is according to the will of God, produces a repentance without regret and leads to salvation. Wow. So while some of you might have a heavy heart, you have to ask yourself, is God trying to teach me something here? Is, is he trying to wake me up? Is, is there something that I'm doing that is constantly repetitive, bringing me to a state of just being so depressed and so down? Because the Bible says that sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance. And so sometimes if we're careful to hear the voice of God, we can see that this heavy heart of ours won't bring us to ruin and destruction if we repent. God is calling for repentance, a turning away from that type of heart. But it's difficult to go against something that you have instilled in you. And that's why the Bible says this in the next uh, verse. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19. I, this is the Lord speaking, will give them a new heart and put in them a new spirit. But the new heart and the new spirit comes from a repentance which came from the broken heartness that you were under and so I want to encourage you today that even if you find yourself today heartbroken not because of other people but because of what you have done with your own hand in your own life know this it might be God working in you sorrow to lead you to repentance Amen. that maybe I shouldn't have hit my wife maybe I shouldn't have hit my kids maybe I shouldn't have and and and, and I'm just I, I'm just I I had a complete loss with myself. Maybe I shouldn't have cheated my taxes. Maybe I shouldn't have done this or that. And it brings you to a place of repentance. You won't be able to stop because your heart is wicked. But with repentance, God brings in a new heart and a new spirit. Because the old heart is wicked and cold and selfish, but the new heart that only God can provide... You know, if you're sad because of the way the economy is going, you, you're happy when they give you a stimulus check, at least for now, until the dollar loses its value, right? Or you're happy with all these tax breaks or whatever it may be. God is not offering you guys stimulus checks to make you happier or to make you complete or to take away your sorrow. What he's doing is he's offering you a path to take that heavy heart and transform it to new life through repentance. And so it's not a loss. Wait, Brother Chris, but hold on. I, you know, I, I was a jerk, and so now I have all these horrible things going on in my life. Allow it for God to use it in his will to bring you to repentance. That way it's not a loss. That way it's not a write-off. That way it's not for nothing. But your heavy heart can bring you to salvation the way the Bible says. Amen? A heavy heart because of my past. This one probably has a lot to do with younger people, but maybe still with the elderly. We're still focusing on ourselves. Whether it was by my own hand and my actions, and I sowed hatred and anger, and I was repaid back hatred and anger. We talked about how that heavy heart can lead to repentance and salvation, and we can have a new heart. But sometimes the bigger hurdle to get over is the past that carries with you a burden. A heavy heart in which you cannot get over. I'm okay with the things I've done now, 
but I can't live with myself of who I was. And some young people or some women might say, that's because I've committed an abortion, or that's because um, uh, maybe I showed off my body in a way that is unpleasing. Or maybe some men would think that's because I I used to get drunk and I used to hit my kids or hit my wife, or, 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 or I used to do many wrong things in the past. I'm changed now, but my heart is burdened because of what I've done, not what I do. I want to bring encouragement to you this morning. Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. We're obviously not going to read all those 17 verses because I want to tell you something. That is the family tree of Jesus the Messiah. And so in that family tree, we don't see saint after saint after saint after saint, or pastor after pastor, or evangelist after evangelist. We actually see some people that you don't want them in your family tree. I mean, unfortunately, they are in our family tree because, you know, you can't pick your family. But we read about Jesus, the Messiah, the coming Savior of the world, and we see his family. And yet, they are still allowed, and in the will of God, even with a broken past, they're still part of the family of Jesus Christ. We see here, we see, um, how many of you have betrayed somebody? You don't have to raise your hand. There are traitors in the family tree of Jesus. How many of you are selfish? There are selfish people in the lineage of Christ. How many people are liars, let alone murderers or adulterers? How many of you have anger issues or laugh at prophecy? How many of you are self-righteous or prideful? How many of you are cowardly, legalistic, deceiver? How many of you are prostitutes? What does this tell me? That... If God doesn't defy you by your past, you better not. Because God also provides for those people, for the adulterer, for the murderer, for the prostitute. He had these promises written for them in mind. Psalms 103, verse 11 through 13. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the love of God for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our sins from us. You see, sometimes we're more self-righteous than God. Or we're more righteous than God. Because when somebody wrongs us or sins, we say, no, nah, okay, that's fine. They, they fixed their relationship with God, but I don't want them to be my friend. I don't want them to be near me, let alone date my daughter or date my son. No way. But you see, God is showing as an example for those of you who this morning are burdened by a heavy heart, not because of what you've done today, but what you did last month or a year ago, and you can't get over it, and it's causing you to be torn down. Listen to this, Isaiah 50, 43, verse 25. I, this is God speaking, am he who blots out your transgressions, that's your sins, for my own sake, and remembers your sins no more. Nobody does that. Your spouse, as much as she or he loves you, doesn't do that. They try to do that, and in so try to be more like Christ, but a lot of times, especially with young people, I hear, okay, I forgive you, but I don't forget. That's demonic. And you might think, well, you know, if you forget, then they walk all over you. There's other biblical principles on how to deal with people who walk all over you. That doesn't mean you don't forgive and forget, meaning they don't bring sorrow in your heart when you see them. Some of you have ex-girlfriends from 50 years ago. When you see them, it's like, oh, Why am I trying to say and focus on this? Because like I said before, your spouses can try. The culture doesn't even try. The second you mess up or say the wrong thing or hashtag the wrong word or do whatever it might be, actually even say hi to the former president of the United States, just hi, not that you support them, just hi, you can be canceled. That, that happened last week. Why? Because people remember But God, when he forgives, he forgets. And you are not greater than God. 
You are not more righteous than God. You are not holier than God. So if he took your sins and threw them into a sea of forgetfulness as far as the east is from the west, please do not allow that type of past to weigh you down and give you a heavy burdened heart. Instead, be encouraged and want to follow and desire a God, a father who truly forgives you. Because God forgives us more than we even want to be forgiven, let alone loves us more than we want to be loved. This is a difficult thing for young people, and, I, and, and, and it's, it's probably because everything's recorded now. Right? I hear a lot of times, probably even me saying this, being 35 years old, thank goodness we didn't have camera phones when we were young, right? We hear that all the time. Because... <laughs> There'd be a lot of people in jail or canceled or they wouldn't have the job that they have. Why? Because everything's recorded now. Brothers and sisters, everything has always been recorded. Maybe not here on a small 1.8 megapixel camera that you can't tell what's going on, but in heaven, everything is recorded. And the beauty about God through the Lord Jesus Christ is that through repentance, he takes your sins, that book, right? Some people's books are like two or three chapters. Mine is like volumes of my sins and my transgressions. And he takes them and he treats me as if I've never done them. He never reminds me. He never brings them up. That's the devil, actually, who brings back all those volumes that God got rid of. And God says to me through these verses, like he's saying to you this morning, forget about it. As difficult as sometimes that, he, that's, that is to hear, and as simple as it is to hear, forget about it. Forget about what your friend did to you 10 years ago, your spouse did to you five years ago. Forget about it. Because it's going to tear you down and bring you to a state that doesn't bring any joy. Doesn't bring any encouragement. But the true encouragement is this. That if you have a past this morning, I don't care what it is. I don't need to know detail. You don't have to come to confessional to me. You confess to God. And he is good and he is righteous to be able to wipe it clean. And then you can come up front, you can sing in the worship team, you can preach, you can, you can wear white to your wedding, whatever it may be, because in front of God's eyes, it's gone. You guys must be tired. Because it's these type of concepts that make me want to fall in love with God more. People say, well, it's the healings. Cancer's gone. And that would be great. COVID's gone, and that would be great. But what's the point of having a cancer-free life and a COVID-free life and being burdened by these type of things? These things are more important. That's why God came through Jesus Christ to address the needs of our souls before the needs of our flesh. And a lot of us get it backwards, and we have to repent of it and go back to the fundamentals through the principles of understanding that it's not just me and my heavy heart that can be alleviated of this burden through my past, but I can help others. Brother Chris, I don't know how to speak to people. I don't have an open door. I don't know how to talk about Christ to anybody. It's very simple. One of these promises probably will open 99% of the doors. Because you can say that you know, I, I was pretty messed up when I was a kid. When I was 18, whoo, man alive. Really, what'd you do? Oh, man. You don't have to give them all the details. And they're like, really? Booyah, booyah, did that? And then you can go, but I don't identify myself with my past. And I don't identify myself with this sorrow because of the fact that even in Jesus' family, he had some pretty messed up people. What? They weren't all popes? No. But they all understood this, that if they come and repent, that it doesn't matter what title you had before, that he wipes them away clean. And that right there might open 99% of all the doors of people that you want to talk to in your life. Friends at school, atheists, uh, Catholics, or Mormons, whoever it might be, to be able to show why you love God. Because he takes that heavy heart of yours and he takes it away. Last one that deals with us personally. And this one... Maybe I'll have the elderly say amen more than the young people, okay? Heavy heart in your life, brother and sister, pay attention, because you're not prepared. We talked about things that we do that cause us suffering. We talked about things that we did that cause us suffering. And now we're going to talk about things that we don't do that cause us suffering. 
Okay, so there are things that we actively do that can bring us pain. We talked about that and how God can use that to bring us repentance. We talked about the things that we, sorry, I was scatterbrained, of my past and how God wipes away those things and so we shouldn't have that burden on our hearts. And then I want to talk about the things that we don't even know how to do. First, first, first and foremost, I want to talk about this. In your life, um, living in your mama's basement is not a plan. Living at your parents' house till you're 30 is not a plan. Being on welfare forever is not a plan. Being on unemployment forever is not a plan. Begging for money is not a plan. Begging for handouts from church or from whoever you may be is not a plan. I understand that people get laid off. I understand that people have hard times, and even in the worst conditions, you do have to ask for money. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that being your plan. And by that being your plan, you have no plan. Have I confused anyone? Because I read in the Bible multiple times that those who are not prepared cause suffering in their own life. And so maybe I, hey, I've not done anything really bad in my life. I've repented. I've come to God. Um, um, I, I don't define myself by the past. I know that God truly wipes away our sins. But I'm still suffering because you have no plan. Some young people think, okay, I just got to get out of high school. I just got to, you know, I just got to finish college. I got to get a career. And, and, and that's a decent basic plan. But I'm talking about the soul. I'm talking about your spirit a lot of people asked me when I was uh, interviewing to get jobs, where do you see yourselves five, ten years from now? Right? It's a normal question. And, and so you think, well, I'd like to be a manager. I want to make six figures. And then, if, and then you never get there. Right? That's a, an illusion question that they use. But I'm here to ask you, what do you want five to six years from now spiritually? Because when they ask us that question in interview, interview, what they're really looking for is, what is your plan to get there? Are you motivated enough? Do you have a system in place to get me from a lowly entry-level engineer to the CEO, right? Do you have a plan? They want to see that your brain is working and that you're not, you know, quote unquote, lazy. But for us, I don't care about your five to 10 year plan here on earth about your career. I care about your five to 10 year plan. No, 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 I care about your one week plan today about your soul because a lot of us don't have a plan for that I want to be a, a, a prophet I want God to work through me to heal I want to preach I want to lead worship what's your plan come to church that's the equivalent of unemployment okay that's the bare minimum that's not a plan so what am I saying well first and foremost what does the Bible say it talks about people who are negligent in thinking both physically and spiritually Make them poor. Proverbs chapter four, uh, chapter ten. Excuse me, verse four. Poor is he who works with a negligent hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. What is this saying here? Have a plan both physically and spiritually. Okay, so I know that at Camp Emmanuel they have a plan. They they have a plan where they want to be a couple years out with the kids, both in lessons and physically uh, in the games, but also spiritually. Where do they want to grow? The church has a plan. What do you want to do physically? Well, we want to fix the roof. Well, we want to add a bathroom. Well, okay, what about spiritually? Well, we want to add more, uh, an English service in the morning. We want to reach out to the neighbors, right? So if we didn't have any of these plans, it would be raining on us and we would all be praying and singing in Romanian, which is not a bad thing, but it's not a plan. So a burdened heart can come from us not planning, not physically, spiritually. Not putting a plan, I, I, I want to meet with God. I, I want to hear from him. So I'm going to read the Bible because that's the way he speaks to me. And I want to speak to him. And so, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray. Okay, I'm going to have a plan. And I don't care if it's just one time a day or one time a week or, or whatever it may be. I'm going to purposely put a, a, a plan in place that God can speak and I can speak to him. Luke chapter 14, these are the words of Jesus. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? What is this saying? Have a plan. Everything that you do, before you get married, you should have a plan. It's, it's not going to come, right? It's not going to work exactly how you want, okay? Because we're all faulted, right? But have a plan. 
on the husband you want to be. Have a plan on the wife you want to be. Have, have a plan on how you want to raise your kids. Not when, here's your baby girl. Oh boy, what do I do now? Okay? And so, besides those things, have a plan on how you prepare your walk with God. Don't let it just be willy-nilly. Well, church is open? Okay, I'll come. Oh, there's a sermon on my phone? Okay, I'll watch it. Those are good things, but that's not a plan. You see, even when you do set up your plan, it's God's plan in the end. We can try to do certain things, and we can try to do you know, an English service in the morning, but it's God's work, and it's God's plan, and it's God's will that is done. Because he is sovereign and he is powerful, and in the end, his plan. And the Bible says for us to align our plans with his. We have many different examples. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says this about your plans. Right? So you're happy. You're like, okay, Brother Chris, I'm going to do it. Not only physically, but spiritually. I'm going to have a plan. Something small. Don't say, I want to be a preacher tomorrow. Okay? Don't, don't, don't do that. You're going to burn yourself out. Just like you don't say, I'm going to be a CEO tomorrow. But simply build on your foundation with a plan on how you and God meet every day. Amen? This is what God says about your plan. And seek all the other things like shelter and clothes. Seek the kingdom of God first. So it's hard to tell people to seek the kingdom of God first when they're seeking nothing. And this generation wants handouts. This generation has to deal with the fact that they don't even care about things. They're just going to stay at home and you're going to give them everything. They don't seek anything. And it's difficult to teach in the word of God that before you go seek out a job and to be harnik is the Romanian word or to be um, sacrificial and hardworking, before you do any of those things, well, if you're not doing those things, how can we preach? Either way, seeking the kingdom of God first. Why? Because then when you make your plans for your physical, they align with the kingdom of God. When you make your plans spiritual, they align with the kingdom of God. When you align your plans to be a good husband, they align with the kingdom of God. Do you see what I'm trying to do here? That before, I want you to understand, you need a plan. Of course, Brother Chris. Okay, well, before you fulfill your plan, align it with the kingdom of God first. You might not make as much money. And you might not have as many friends. But you'll be doing what Jesus asks of you. To seek the kingdom of God first. And then that heavy heart that you have that comes from not being prepared, from not knowing where your next meal might come or your next spiritual meal might come from. Jesus said that he is the bread of life. What does that mean? Okay, so that we're always chasing after where does my next meal come from? But how many of us ask, when does my next spiritual meal come from? Because I'm dying here and I haven't eaten in a long time and I haven't prayed in a long time and I haven't read the Bible in a long time because there's no plan to eat. For us, it's easy. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Okay, that's physical. What about spiritual? Morning, noon, and night. Do you have devotions? Never. Do you have this? No. Do you fast? No, man, alive. Never. Why? Because you don't plan for it. But if we plan for it, then the burden of our heart and the sufferings in our life would come to realign with the kingdom of God, and that suffering or that sorrow will go away. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8. Your thoughts and plans are not my thoughts and plans. Now that's a simplified version of that verse because I'm running out of room on the screen, but in a sense what it's saying is that don't think that your plan is the best plan. It's only my way. Nope. It is the Pentecostal plan. It is this de denomination plan. It is the American dream plan. It is the Romanian plan. No, 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 no. God's thoughts and his plans are different than ours. And the only way that our plans and our thoughts align with him is by fulfilling the verse above it, by seeking the kingdom of God first and his righteousness and then all those other things. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. You might think, well, why don't our plans align? Is it because God's bad? No, that's not it at all. In the midst of suffering, Jeremiah says this, from God to his people, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper, plans for hope, and plans for a future. That might be difficult to hear when you're in captivity. 
That might be difficult to hear when your children are being torn away from you and made slaves. Just as it is difficult for you in the benches to hear with your burdened heart that God has a plan for you to prosper, one filled with hope, and one that brings a future in your life. But not unless we do what we did initially. Understanding the promises to not have a heavy heart, but to have Jesus Christ be the one who empowers your heart. Who gives you strength who walks you through these valleys, whether it be the shadow of death in the valleys low or on the high of parts of the mountain, wherever your plan takes you. A heavy heart. I can't take that away from you. But what can are the principles written in the Bible. And most of the time, our heavy heart is because we don't want to agree to them or read them. When I argue with my wife, I know exactly verse and chapter of what I need to do. And I don't. She's not in church, so. And I don't. Oh, so you're prolonging your suffering? Of course I am. Why? Because I'm stubborn and I'm sinful and I'm prideful. And the only time that this heavy heart of mine is uplifted is when I repent. And I do what the Bible says. But I'm only given grace by God to be able to do that. Some people have been in that state for years, not against their wives, but against the God who created them. We're running out of time, so next time we're going to talk about friends. We talked about the heavy heart that we ourselves can bring upon ourselves. That is my fault. It's not their fault. Okay, I'm not the victim. It's my, I walked this way and I got hit by a car. Why? Because I walked in the street, not at the crosswalk. It was my fault. I'm reaping what I'm sowing. The heart is deceitful. The heart is wicked. And the only way I can have a new heart that God places in me is by repenting through the sorrow in my life. So don't waste it. And then we talked about the past. And some of you have a very, very heavy past. And we don't even want to talk about it or talk about details. Instead, what we're going to do is point to the fact that God removes your sins and forgets them as far as the east is from the west. And then we concluded with having a plan, not just physically, but spiritually. Where do you want to be from a week from now, a month from now, months from now, years from now? Where do you want to be? How close do you want to be from God? Because without a plan, it'll only be how far will I be from God? So you, you, what are you going to do about yourself? What am I going to do about me? And what are you going to do about you? Because next week or the next time I'm scheduled to preach, it's going to be about friends and how they can burden you and what the Bible says about that. And about family, when family burdens you, because family never burdens you. And then unfortunately, sometimes we think that God burdens us. We think that way, but the Bible has an explanation for that, and we'll get to it. So let's stand, please. I tried to be as encouraging as I possibly could. I even smiled more than I normally smile. Why? Because it's a difficult topic. I can't just pray away or wish away or sprinkle some water on you and then all of a sudden all of your problems are gone. And I'm not going to minimize anyone's problems from the greatest to the least. But what I've tried to do by preaching the word of God is showing that there are instances in our lives where we are suffering or we have a heavy heart because of our own hand or because of our own past or because of our lack of planning. But through the word of God, we see what we can do at each one of these steps. And brothers and sisters here at this church, one of the things that we try to do as much as possible is to get everyone on this side of the pulpit to respond to God. To respond to God in prayer. For everything that you heard, whether it was through the worship songs or the children or, or, or the verses that were mentioned by the brother earlier, or the sermon, whatever it may be, God has spoken to you this morning some way or somehow. He has taken that heart of yours and he says, do you see why it's burdened? And he's probably poked or prodded something that leads you to wanting to speak to him. For some, that's repentance. For some, that's joy. For some, that's thanking him. But whatever it may be, it's prayer. And so don't leave this morning without prayer. Prayer is the number one thing that we do when we come here. 
The reason we preach is for us to pray. The reason that we sing is for us to pray. The reason we bring up testimony to build up the church is for us to pray, to glorify God, to worship God, to tell him thank you that the world destroys us and gives us an even heavier heart. But you take away our heart and give us a new one, not one of stone, not one of bitterness, but one of joy and one of flesh. And so what is your response, my dear brother and sister, to that? One of quietness? One of, I can't wait to get out of here and have lunch? No. The Bible says that after the disciples prayed together, the place that they were filled, uh, the place that they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. If it can do that, it can take your heavy heart. Because Jesus says that my burden is light. You have a heavy heart, Jesus has a lighter burden. And the yoke, the weight on your shoulders is an easy one when you come to Christ. So let us come together. Let us call out, whether it be in your mind, in your vocal, uh, whether it be on your knees, whether it be standing up, whether it be sitting down, however it may be. But don't let these next 10 minutes, these next few moments in your life, be one that is wasted. Instead, let us come together as one voice, as one body, as one set of brothers and sisters and believers to come together and to worship God in prayer. Amen? Let's do it. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you so much for the fact that we were able to come together and hear, Lord, about the status of our hearts, the hearts that can sometimes be so burdened, the hearts that can be so heavy, the hearts that can be so...